And welcome back into a, I will call it a brand new podcast because it is a brand new studio. Okay, it's not a brand new podcast. It's the Falcons Audible, still presented by AT&T. It's still Derek Rackley, Dave Archer, and DJ Shockley. But it is our first Falcons Audible Ooh. in our new digs, in the new podcast suite in Ticketmaster Studios. Smells, Isn't it lovely? It's, it now, smells fresh in here. Now, granted, to the average viewer, I mean, you know, we all look good. We still probably look good in the last studio, but if you guys could just really see what we were sitting in, which you're not going to be able to see the whole thing, but this thing is beautiful. Yes. It is lush, it is luxurious, and we are in it. Yeah, the one thing I'll say about it is that I'm probably the shortest at 6'2". Shock, 6'2 and a half, maybe 6'3". You're bigger than that. None of our feet are touching the floor. <laughs> I just want to yeah, let you know. We are we're jacked swinging. up on these chairs here. We're <laughs> swinging. Just, it's great. So uh, if you see one of us just slide out of the picture, <laughs> the rolling chairs are working. Right. <laughs> All right, let's get into uh, what we are going to discuss today because we are post-draft and we are excited because as we talked about Arch last week, we've got some new blood in the organization. Mm. We've got some new talent that we've got to talk about and it's the first time that us three get to break it down. So here's what we're going to discuss. We're going to get our first reactions of B. John Robinson at number eight to the Falcons along with the rest of the Atlanta Falcons draft picks this year. We're going to get a grade on the Falcons draft this year. I know Arch cannot wait. He loves draft grades. We'll get him going here in just a second. State of the NFC South, and then we will look ahead to the 2023 schedule release. So that's the schedule. Fellas, let's get to it. Um, I want to start with uh, the draft for the Falcons, DJ, in three words. Okay. Now, I know that sometimes, Arch, Shock, <laughs> we deviate from the rules, but let's see how good you guys follow it. Atlanta Falcons draft in three words. I'm usually not the one that breaks the rules, by the way. It's usually Arch always and trying to put it off on me. <laughs> see? See? But I'm going to go three words. I'm going to go smart, versatile, and productive. How about that? I wow. like it. Even. I like it. Oh, so he went with strictly <laughs> three words, commas. Yeah. Like yeah. TCU in yeah. the national title game. I'm done. I'm, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> I like it. One more time. Smart, productive. Versatile. Versatile. Yes. We will get into be a word some of that use a lot today. versatility here yeah. in just a minute. All right, Arch, your nice. turn. Three yeah. words. What you got, Arch? I'm going to use a short phrase. Yes. Woo! Was very effective. Yeah. Yes. Was very that was good. effective. That was good. That was good. I like it. No, you All right. came so up. we got just three words. We have short phrase. Uh -huh. I'm with you. I'm going short phrase. Okay. My three words, let's freaking go. <laughs> okay? Because we got uh, some playmakers that came into the organization. This follows up on free agency, which we have broken down ad nausea. I want to see this team on the field. Let's freaking, freaking. Go. Yeah, like get them that. on the field and let's yeah. start playing some football games. All right. Let's get just dive into it. Obviously, we have not gotten a chance, us three, to, to really break down the picks. I want to start. We're going to go with our first round pick. B. John Robinson. Polarizing pick to some arch because everybody wants to say, why do you pick a running back in the first round? You can't pick a running back in the first round. It's too early to pick a running back <laughs> in the first round. Okay, it doesn't happen very often. Highest drafted running back since Saquon Barkley. Give us your take on Bijan Robinson at number eight. Sorry for knocking your phone. That's over okay. Bijan Bijan uh, is a transcendent player. A lot of people said he's a generational player. Uh, you and I were doing a show last week. I don't even know what that means, but <laughs> I I do know I do know that he was the best offensive player in the draft. Yep. Okay. And the things that he brings to the table are obviously uh, you can see it. When you watch him play at Texas, he had three years at Texas. The thing I love about the guy, obviously the start-stop, the acceleration, the home run ability, catch the ball out of the backfield, a willing blocker in protection, does all of that stuff. Patience in the run game, vision, all the things you like. He broke 104 tackles, which led the nation last year in broken tackles. Only 539 carries, Rack, in his career at Texas. Yeah. You compare that to a, a Jonathan Taylor, who I know played four years at Wisconsin, 1,200 carries. Yeah. You're mm -hmm. talking about a dude that comes in, those tires are brand new. Yeah, half I the mean, amount of tread. Exactly. He's ready to roll, and I think he fits exactly what they want to do. Oh, by the way, the DNA of a player, this guy was a captain on the football team, which you'll find throughout the guys yeah. that the Falcons yep. drafted. Yep. Leadership, the and the guy wants to he's, – he's already got a plan for what he wants to do here in the community, so he fits the DNA across the board. Absolutely. Um, Ar uh, Arch, you hit it on the head. DJ, what's your take on this? Because, you know, you, you hear – 
a running back in the first round, coming on the heels of a, a pretty good player they drafted last year that proved his worth in Tyler Algier. So you add another running back to the room, but this guy is a phenomenal talent. You mentioned off best offensive player in a the draft. There are people saying he might be the best player in a draft, which is saying something over quarterbacks. What's your take? I had no problem with it. And obviously, I think we look at it from a different lens as far as what this guy can add to a team, the value that he brings right away. And I don't care what's been said over the years about running backs. Yeah, things have happened, and it happens five, six, seven years down the road. Are we worried about that right now? Yeah. <laughs> We're worried about this upcoming season and the productivity that he can have for this team. And when you look at some of the things that he can do, and then you think about some of the things that, that's been said about him. I went back and looked at some of the things that people were saying about him, and one thing was an impact football player. Mm -hmm. I heard Arthur Smith say the contact balance that he has when he runs the football, a complete player, a home run hitter. All these are things that if you're looking to draft a guy and you hear all these things about a guy – you're going to say, nah, I don't really want that kind of player on my team. I don't want that kind of guy who can do all those things on his team. And then you go <laughs> and you talk about uh, – I heard Sar his head coach Sarkeesian talk about him. He said he is everything that you like, want, and need on and off the field. He said you can run inside, can run outside. He's a guy that if I need to talk to a player, he can talk to a player. If I need him to talk to the media, he can do that. If, you know, he's going to date my daughter, I wouldn't mind that. <laughs> like, he said he's everything you want – in a football player, in a person. And for me, when people say, ah, I don't know if I want that guy, and somebody presents you with all these characteristics yeah, of, a, yeah. of a guy, why would you not want him on a team? And I know you guys are here. Everybody got a chance to probably hear him speak. The guy is so likable. The yes. guy is one of those type of guys that you want to have in your locker room. And he doesn't come in with that aura of I'm this big, huge, number eight overall pick and everything is coming to me. So humble. And that's the kind of guy you want on your team. So I, I love the pick. I love uh, Arch broke down all the things that he can do within a game. And it's only going to add value to having Tylo Algier when now defenses come up and say, all right, we got to worry about Algier, who's the sledgehammer of our offense and then you got this guy who you can line him up in the slot you can put him outside you can you know do so many different things with him I just think the value that you get with him exceeds anything that you have may have thought about running backs over the years think about this personnel group guys they go 23 which is two tight ends three backs and you're thinking wow what do we run there wishbone <laughs> okay you got CP in the game you got Algier in the game you got Bijan Robinson in the game John, who's at one, one tight end, Kyle Picks is the other tight end. You, you, you got that group in the huddle. So if I'm on defense, I'm saying, wait a minute, that's big. How I got to match I got to get yeah. big people in. I got to, yeah. I got to, I got to, all of a sudden, you get a shift call at the line of scrimmage and all of them explode out into an empty set Whoa. because Whoa. you've got five guys on the field that can catch the rock. Right. I thought you were going to run the wishbone right. at me. Now you're going to throw out. the rock at me. <laughs> Time out. That's a preparation problem, yes. okay, because if you can yes. put that personnel group on the field and we know the the receiving abilities of both Bijan Robinson and CP, by the way, Tyler Algier, outstanding receiver out of the back of which he proved uh -huh. a number of times, and then you get those two pass-catching tight ends that explode out and all of a sudden those are your two wide receivers, that's a problem, and, and teams are going to have to try to adjust to that. What package do you have on the field? That's a major plus as you start talking about preparation. Yeah, how do you match up against that group, guys? Uh, we could probably, no disrespect to the rest of the draft, we could probably do this entire <laughs> – um, podcast on just B. John Robinson. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to finish with this point because I've thought a lot about the running back pick throughout the weekend. Because a couple people text me on Thursday saying, who do you think the Falcons are going to pick? I gave my my selection. They said, well, what do you think about B. John Robinson? I was like, you know, I'm not usually high on running backs that high on the draft. But the more I thought about it is this. Here's, for, for the people that are listening, here's the nuts and bolts of it, in my opinion, Okay. You got draft pundits out there, Mel Kuyper, Todd McShay, Pro Football Focus, us three. Everybody wants to give you their mock draft, who they want to get. Nobody gets to spend as much time with these players as the NFL teams. No doubt. As the Atlanta Falcons. The coaching staff took a trip to Austin. They brought TQ Graham, who is a Texas long with them. What a good barbecue. They went and had barbecue with this guy, <laughs> and they just wanted to spend time with him, and then they worked him out. People that are doing draft grades don't get don't that. Let. Number one, yeah. that's the first thing that I thought about. Number two, Mel Kuyper does not have to put a football team on the field in the fall. Yeah. He is not being graded on wins and losses in the fall. These guys are. 
right? And they felt with their eighth pick that this guy changes the game for them. Mm -hmm. Just like you said, makes a matchup nightmare problem for other teams. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter that he's a running back that was picked eighth. This organization felt like Bijan Robinson was the guy that's going to make them better. End of discussion, and right? It, here's one other thing, I, and I know Arch will agree with me on this. As a quarterback, and we're talking about Desmond Ritter walking into this season as the guy, Arthur Smith has already said it, and the way he improved last season. But you think about the personnel grouping that Arch just talked about, and as a quarterback to come to the line of scrimmage and to have the answer before the ball is even snapped <laughs> does wonders for any quarterback, let alone a guy who is stepping into that role. So if I walk to the line of scrimmage and now I can see disrail the defense and they're not sure what's going on, but I know exactly where I want to go to football because of all these different matchups that I can go with, it makes your life that much easier as yeah. a quarterback. So. They went into this process knowing, hey, I got a good guy that I can absolutely put into this role, but how is this guy going to help all other 10 guys on the field? How yeah. is he going to help that guy standing next to him on Sundays? That's a huge deal. Yeah. So, kind of back to my three words, let's freaking go. I want to see these guys <laughs> yeah. on the field. Like I said, we yeah. could talk about Bijan Robinson for probably 30 sure. minutes on his own, no but doubt. let's get to the rest of the picks. All right, Arch, I want to go now to Matthew Bergeron. There was some talk that has been leaked out that a certain NFL team in the state of Texas was <laughs> eventually going to draft this guy in the first round, but Atlanta ends up getting him in the second round. What does Atlanta get out of Matthew Bergeron from Syracuse? Well, you get a guy that's played a lot of football. One, uh, another captain of his football team, another one of those kind of guys, but a guy that has the ability to road grade in the run game, was outstanding in the pass protection. Now, he played left tackle, which when you start talking about teams that, that draft – specific guys whether it's a left tackle edge rusher quarterback those kind of are the three that jump out this guy m most your best offensive lineman in college play left, left tackle. tackle yeah yeah okay yep. so now you've got a guy that's the best player on that team they ran the ball with extremely good uh, uh efficiency up there for dino babers at syracuse in fact won their first six games out of the box this guy was a big part of that now what he does, and it's it's been already stated, he's going to slide to the inside. He's going to slide inside Jake Matthews. He's going to play at that left guard position. This guy was coveted based on what my grades were. I had him the number four or five tackle on the board. We saw four tackles go in the first round. He was the next one. In fact, he was being bandied about, about late first round as coming off the board. Um, that was some of what was going on, some scuttlebutt. And Atlanta decided to trade up. Let's make sure we get our guy. They did a lot of research on this dude from a – Playtime standpoint, from a leadership standpoint, and then from a just he, I get it standpoint, uh, as far as understanding what they're doing, then you met you factor in the measurables of six foot five, six six, three hundred and twenty pounds. You like the way that looks. DJ, mm -hmm. I'm gonna go back to one of the words you used at the beginning. Versatility. No doubt. Right? So Matthew Bergeron, as you mentioned, Arch played left tackle. A lot mm -hmm. of the uh, offensive linemen that come out that high are tackles, but he is probably slated to move in to play guard. They're getting a bigger Physical, as you mentioned, road grader, 6'5", 323 pounds. They're getting bigger up front. So you get a guy that maybe is going to be the opening day starter at guard. Who knows? Just kind of spitballing here. But something happens. He's got the ability and comfort level to jump out and play either tackle position if they need him to. And as we go through the entire draft class, I think we're going to look at every single play on here and say they could probably play something else. Yeah. They could probably do something else within the offense or the defense. And this is no different. Talk about 31 games at left tackle, uh, another eight at right tackle, uh, you know, 39 starts. It just tells you that this guy, for one, is durable, is dependable, consistent. He's there for you, like I mentioned, being a big part of what the Qs did last season. But I think the biggest thing is his ability to come inside. He spoke about it. He said, I think it's a lot easier to go from outside to inside. But also, I think you, you know from the inside standpoint, things happen a little bit faster. Uh, on the outside, you know, guys are trying to, you know, they got moves and all this kind of stuff. On the inside, you got to be able to quit. You got to think about it. he's going to go against Grady Jarrett every single day. So, you know, he's going to sharpen that iron every <laughs> single day when he goes against 9-7. You got, you know, Anya Mata coming in, another guy who can, can definitely kind of baptize him before he gets mm -hmm. to uh, the regular season. So, there's going to be a lot of guys that he can absolutely learn from early uh, in his training camp. But I love the fact that he's one of those guys that's willing to move down inside. But also, like you mentioned, Rack, can go outside if you need him. So this gives you so much depth at this particular spot up front 
that gives you different options to say, all right, if we have a guy that's maybe not playing well, we got a guy that's, you know, we we want to try something else, he can be one of those kind of kind of swing guys for you. And I was looking at some some stuff on him, and the guy played defenseman in hockey growing up in Quebec. He says <laughs> it gave him great balance and helped him when he, when he played O-line. Personally, I don't know what a defenseman is, but he played <laughs> hockey. So I know, obviously, this guy's got some feet work about him. This guy is versatile. So it's, it's body fun to control. Can, no you ima- can you imagine if you're a, you're, a, you're a winger or something coming down and that dude's standing there at six foot five <laughs> on <laughs> skates? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my man's six eight, six nine standing back there. I mean, just head busting out yeah. of his helmet, yeah. right? His hockey yeah. helmet. Yeah. Uh, so we, we go two offensive players early on, flexibility with Bergeron. Let's flip it over to the defensive side they get a player out of Ohio State obviously played in some very meaningful football games Zach Harrison addresses another immediate need kind of comes on the heels of free agency as you mentioned DJ they add David Onyemata they add Calais Campbell they add Caden Ellis guys that can get after the quarterback you're getting a guy now that is a traditional defensive end he's got size to him as well Arch yeah. six five and a half 275 pounds they're getting a big guy to rush the passer he is going to put his hand in the ground and get after opposing tackles. May still have to kind of find his way, refine his skill set a little bit, but what do you think Atlanta gets in Harrison? Well, I think you get versatility again. That seems to be the operative word. You're talking about a guy at 6'6", 270, 275. So now all of a sudden, uh, is he playing 4'3", conventional defensive end? He could kick inside and rush as a three technique mm-hmm. off of the inside in a NASCAR type package mm-hmm. where you're rushing the passer. Maybe uh, Malone and Ebicati are coming off the edge. Uh, Lorenzo Carter coming off the edge, and all of a sudden he kicks inside. Now you got a problem with a guy that's a little bit quicker yep. that still has the Woo! strength. He's got, he's got heavy he's got heavy hands against the run game. If you watch him in the run game, he puts hands on you. You feel it. That, that's what's cool about him. Now, did the numbers didn't necessarily match up? You, you had a guy like Chase Young come out. Or you had Bosa come out of there. And so a lot of elevated numbers out of yeah. those guys. He was supposed to be the next guy. Numbers didn't necessarily match that. What I interpret that is, is he's going to be a late developer. We've seen it. We've seen a number of guys develop late in their careers to get up here. I'm looking at J.J. Watt, three-star guy, went to Wisconsin. Next thing you know, he's defensive player of the year. Not saying he's J.J. Watt, but this guy has a, a huge upside to him, size. And think Cam Jordan. Okay, when you start thinking about guys that are bigger defensive ends that kind of fit in both the 4 3 3 4 scheme as you ebb and flow back and forth, this guy's got the similar size of Cam Jordan. Who coached Cam Jordan? The guy that's the defensive coordinator here. Yep. So I love that mix. And, oh, by the way, Calais Campbell, who's a big defensive Come end, on. that's a nice guy to be able to learn from as well. Well, learn you you talked about learn from Calais Campbell, learn from Grady Jarrett, learn from David Onyemata. Yes. He's coming into a pretty good defensive line room, DJ. Yeah, you talk about even Bud Dupree and as well. You're talking about yeah. trying to make sure that he honed the skills of being a good pass rusher. You got a guy coming in here who's been around, been a veteran, like Calais Campbell, like Bud Dupree, on your mind. I mean, you got so many guys in here that he can learn from. And then you just talked about it, having Ebby Cady here last year who came on for us, you know, late in the season. Malone, another guy who is a young guy who last year we talked about it kind of the same way, is going to have to develop into that kind of role. Now you bring guys around him that can help him. He doesn't have to come in here right away and say, mm-hmm. okay, I got to be the guy. I got to try to get eight, nine sacks in my rookie year. He can learn from these guys and kind of benefit from that. And then, hey, you get two, three, four sacks coming here. We saw Malone come in late in the year, have a couple play uh, during the season. This is, a, I think, a really good pick because of we mentioned the value that you got from other two guys. The value comes in with the guys that's in the room with him. So I think he will learn so much from those guys, and that will elevate his game going into, I think, this season. So it's, it's going to be fun to see what he turns into. But you know he has the skill set. You know he has the ability, he has the size, but you just want to see it kind of molded a little bit more. And he's got guys in there who he will instantly come into that room and say, okay, this guy, Calais Campbell, been in here 16 years. Yeah. You know exactly what he's about. I got 100 about. sacks in his pocket. <laughs> I got to learn from him. So it's fun to have those kind of guys in the room where you got a mix of young, got a mix of guys who's been in it for a little bit like Bud Dupree, and then you got guys who have absolutely done it and can set the standards. So it's going to be cool to see that. I think it's such a great point that Shock makes in the fact that he's not expected to come in here and lay 10 sacks on the board. Okay, you'd love to have it, right? Sure, (laughs) sure. But he comes in here, and now he's got the opportunity to learn from these guys, as Shock just talked about, and the expectation level, albeit you want that pressure on you, and he'll feel some of it because he's a draft pick. 
he isn't expected to come in and have ten. Will Anderson, when he gets to when he gets to Houston, ASAP. if he yeah. if he doesn't have twelve sacks, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Ten sacks, right? For sure. That's not going to be laid at the feet of Zach Harrison. So he's going to have a chance to learn. And let's not forget now when we're talking about sacks, Ryan Nielsen's defense in uh, New Orleans, forty-seven sacks in two thousand twenty-two. Mm-hmm. Fourteen different guys contributed to 47 sacks. 47 sacks put him in the upper seven or eight teams in the National Football League, yeah. which is where you want to be. Yeah. That was led by Cam Jordan with eight and a half sacks. So <laughs> it can be done by a variety of players. I think this guy gets his as a part of what Shock's talking about, a group of players getting after the pass. You guys, variety of players, group of players. I'm just like trying to quickly do the math. Eva Katie, yeah. Malone, yeah. Dupree, Harrison, Anyamata, Calais Campbell, Carter. <laughs> I mean, you yeah. got, you got, you you got you Grady Jarrett, TQ Graham. Like, there's only so many roster spots, fellas. You think yeah. about the competition that's going to go on in training camp? That's, that's like, fun. these guys are going to be balling because they know that they got to earn a roster no spot. Doubt. The, there's not this many roster spots on right. the 53 man, yeah. right? So it's going to be exciting as we get into training camp. Mm. Speaking of exciting, maybe the one of the most intriguing picks of this draft, fellas, is Clark Phillips the third out of Utah. They get him in the fourth round. Many and I mean many people saying this is first or second round talent player, and the only reason he slipped is size. Mm-hmm. NFL is about measurables, mm. and Clark Phillips comes in at five nine, 190 pounds. But you know what that kind of spells to me? You might have just got your slot player for next year. <laughs> you might have just got your corner that's going to kick inside, play the slot, and this kid gets after the football. Mm-hmm. He has shown it time after the time. Arch, what, do we, what does Atlanta get in Clark Phillips III? Well, you get a dog. You're going to get a guy. and he. Whenever you're that size and people keep talking about it, oh. but you're the first-team All-America corner, yeah. then you got a little something about you, yeah. right? Again, another captain of his football team. This guy was a captain at Utah. Nine career interceptions, four he took to back for touchdowns. Huh. He, he's got a knack, as, as Rack said, about getting his hands on the football and then the versatility to play corner if you needed to and to kick inside and play in the slot, which we you talk about how crowded the D-line room is. <laughs> yeah. The DB room's getting pretty crowded at yep. the corner spot <laughs> with those two guys you signed in Hughes and Akuda that are going to join yep. A.J. Terrell and Obi D. D. Alford, Corey Armstrong. So that's getting pretty crowded in there as well. But he'll come in and mix in there. But what I like is go to AtlantaFalcons.com and listen to this guy talk because he understands all the things they're saying about him. Well, you went in the fourth round because you're 5'9". Okay. Okay. Well, I'll get you a place to sit. Watch me play. He wants to come in and lay it down on the field. He says it verbatim on the interview. Go watch it. It's a fun watch. The dude's got more confidence than than anybody that I've talked to or watched say anything in the draft this year. And even even with that size, you turn on the tape, he's playing press man. Yeah. He can play off. He can play like you mentioned, play inside, play outside. He don't care. He wants the action. When they say, Hey, I want some smoke <laughs> Clark Phillips says, I want to smoke to anybody. <laughs> and it's going to be fun because guess what? He's going to be able to go against Drake London every day, Mac Hollins, who are all giants when it comes to right. receivers. <laughs> but guess what? I guarantee you, day one, he's going to step up there. He's going to be a yard away, and he's going to be trying to get in that grill. That's what you like about yeah. one of these type of guys. They're scrappy, but they're also savvy enough to understand how to use that frame, how to use that body, how to go against these guys. This won't be the first time he's going against big, tall, physical receivers. Yeah. He'll be ready for us. I love this pick. I love it, again, for the versatility. We talk about being able to do a lot of different things. And then the, the dude gets the football in his hands. He going to put some numbers up. Yeah, he's going to make that's, things that's happen. That's the thing you like, too. Yeah, yeah I think he had 240 return yards. In yeah. Yeah. It's so this is not just a guy that's picking off the ball and falling <laughs> to the turf. Right. Nah. Like he's making something happen yeah. after the catch. You know, I think it's great that you guys kind of outlined the captain, the leadership. You see the trend on from free agency, Calais Campbell, Jesse Bates, mm. David Onyemata, to now in the draft. You see what Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith are going after. High character, yeah. amazing human beings. Yeah. That means something to them. Yeah. Again, it doesn't matter what draft pundits think you should pick with a certain pick. It matters what those guys think is going to mesh the best in this building. Mm -hmm. They're getting really good football players that are extremely high-character young men. That's kind of the theme that we're seeing so far. And the other thing that I'm going to say, the last thing about Phillips, when when you've got size and everybody's that's all they talk about, you know what they play with? Chip on their shoulder. No question. You won't keep talking about my size? 
Okay, I'm going to match up against Drake London and Matt Collins at 6-4 in training camp every day. I'm going to be right Watch there. me ball, yeah. okay? That's what I'm excited to see out of him. All right, final. Uh, let's. I want you guys to sum together or pick one. DeMarco Hellams and Jovan Gwynn, the last two picks Atlanta ends up getting in the draft. Okay, I'll, I'll jump on Hellams. Uh, Hellams was, a, again, a captain, led the Alabama in, t- in, in, in uh, tackles. I don't. Maybe people don't know that, but he was the leading tackler for the, the Crimson Tide this last year. Hellams is a tough kid, very competitive kid and what happens to me with with Helms is does he contribute on uh, on defense absolutely all of a sudden when you start upgrading your talent that upgrades the special teams as 100%. well and and Helms is going to be a core special teams player we already know he can tackle he led Alabama in tackling so we know he can do that his ability to cover his ability to block and cut in some of the return teams uh, I think that what he does is yes he elevates the safety room because of his uh, of his abilities, and if you do have an injury or two, God forbid, you got to plug a guy in. He's ready to do that because he played a ton of snaps at Alabama at safety. But look what happened to Marquise Williams' group. Mm. I mean, this dude steps in the room, and now all of a sudden, again. By the way, I keep to keep repeating, repeating myself. Captain yeah. of the Alabama team, <laughs> yeah. another guy, a leader, as Rack was talking about, that steps into that special teams room shock and immediately upgrades you. Love Helms. I mean, obviously, as you know, a guy who watches the SEC a lot, two number two is the guy you always saw when Alabama was on defense, and a guy out there making all the calls, making all the adjustments, and a guy who ain't afraid to put his hat in there and make a play. He will be an outstanding special team player, as you mentioned. We move on to J- Javon Gwynn. The first thing I start with is two time. Captain, I mean <laughs> leaders. I mean it's leaders. It's, it's right down the board. Man. I mean it's not even. I mean it, you talk about the strategy. There is a clear vision of what this staff wanted to do in the draft. And here's another two-time captain. This guy had 49, 47 starts. My excuse me, forty-seven starts in forty-nine games. Tells you what this guy's about. Plays center and guard. Another word we use again, versatile. Yep. Can be inside and out. I think he's similar to uh, what we talked about, a guy who can be kind of a developmental guy like we talked about with Harrison, a guy that gives you really good depth, but a guy who has some experience. But you hear him talk, the guy wants to come in here and compete right away. And that's what you want, obviously. Going in the seventh round, he's going to be excited. He's going to be one of those guys that has a chip on his shoulder, probably felt mm. like he should go early, playing five years inside the SEC, having 47 starts, playing both inside and outside, a two-time captain. So that tells you this guy has the moxie to go out and be the guy and consistently do it. And that's what you like, too. So uh, he's going to be fun to, to be around, a fun guy to have, add depth to, but also – He's going to be ready to go if you need him. Yeah, don't dispel the seventh round, too, because unless they say, oh, he's a late-round pick, so if you get something from him, so be it. 47 consecutive mm-hmm. starts now at, at South Carolina, which Jacques pointed out, um, but plays center. 6'2", about 300 pounds. Another seventh-round pick keeps coming to mind. Didn't we just put him in the ring of honor this last year? <laughs> mm-hmm. Not saying he's going to be yep. mud duck, but don't discount a seventh-round draft McClure. pick. Yep, one of the better uh, offensive call, linemen to ever call. play in this franchise. Um you guys have played a lot of football in your career, and, and I would say that, in my experience, some of the best teams have been player-led teams. Yeah. Okay? So can you see here what Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith are trying to do? They bring in Calais Campbell. They bring in Jesse Bates. They bring in all these guys that are captains of their college teams. They're bringing in leaders. They want these players to lead the organization. Yes, Arthur Smith's got to be the head coach. Yes, the assistant coach has got to get him in the right places. But the leaders need to take control of the team, and that's where special things come. All right, DJ, let's wrap this up. I need you to give me a grade on this draft class for the Atlanta Falcons. I I give it an A. I mean, obviously this is – a group of individuals that I think will add so much value. There's depth. There's the leadership part of what we talked about. There's productivity in college that you like. Played at some major universities. Did some really good things. And then there's guys that you know are going to show up every single day and bring it. There are guys that you know are looking for this opportunity. And if you, if you had a chance to hear any of these guys talk, you know what kind of guys they are. And you know when they step in, step up here to Flowery Branch, they're going to be giving you something that obviously it's a reason why they went and drafted. So I, I love this draft class. I thought their, uh, their production in college is definitely going to match what's happening once they get here, once they figure out exactly what the pro game is all about. But these are all quality individuals, first off, that you don't have to worry about things that are going to go on with them off the field. But you know on the field, they gonna, it's going to go down because they want all the action and they're going to bring it. Love it. 
Dave? I just don't know how you how you do the grade thing. I mean, <laughs> how do you do the grade thing when they haven't even played yet? So if we graded them based on what they did in college, it's an A plus because yeah. they were all really good in yeah. college, right? Yeah. Talking about Phillips being a three, it was an All American, first team All American. He went in the fourth round. Does that mean he's not not as good? I don't think I don't think so. If I had to put a grade on it, I'd put a B on it. And the only reason I'd put a B on it is there's some developmental pieces here. Okay, Matthew Bergeron is gonna have to slide from tackle inside. Can he do it? Absolutely. That's why they took him to do it. But it's got to develop. It's got to happen. Might be a learning curve. Okay. Yep. Zach Harrison comes in, third-round draft pick. He's going to have to develop and learn like we talked about. Now, if he's willing to absorb that information, I mean, the sky's the limit for this guy. Big dude that can come off the edge. Could he be a Cam Jordan? Maybe. He could be one of those kind of guys. But still, there's a developmental process that I think Bijan Robinson is the goods. Yeah. I don't think there's any question yeah. about that. If you're downgrading that draft pick, you're an idiot. Okay? <laughs> I mean, the guy can you know, completely ball. And then the guys in the back end of the draft with Phillips and the guys we just talked about and how they can contribute, there's a developmental piece to it. And so – Instead of giving it an A and everybody's going to start and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to go ahead and uh, I'm going to go ahead and give it a B and give us some room to grow. Yeah, which I think this team will do. I like that. And and here's the other thing that I think is hard to grade the draft is because it's a it's the another it's it's a piece that just followed free agency. Mm-hmm. So to me, I don't think you can just grade the draft because I think you need to dra- grade entire, free agency entire, and the draft. Yeah. Because yeah. think about the players that they brought in in free agency they all go together and then sure. the draft just complemented or helped fill the gaps that didn't get filled in free agency. So as we do sometimes, I'm not going to grade the draft. I'm going to grade the draft in free agency mm. and I'm going to give it an A minus. And the only reason is maybe I would have liked to have seen a wide receiver come in in the draft at some point. It didn't happen. They bring a couple undrafted free agents. Maybe they strike gold in those guys, right? But just another young wide receiver added to this core would be my own. But other than that, thinking about what the guys want, what the guys in this building want and what they brought in, how can you criticize it? That's the way that I look at it. I like it. I like it. Good call. All right. So now let's move on real quick. I know we're probably getting close to time here, but – State of the NFC South. You guys have had a chance to kind of see some of the other teams in this division and how they've been able to upgrade their teams, where they stood on free agency prior to the draft. So, DJ, I'm going to start with you. How does Atlanta stack up with the rest of the division now as we've gone through the majority of the personnel process of this offseason? Uh, I think you look around the league and, and you look at some of the things that other teams have done. Obviously, the Panthers go out and get Bryce Young. Obviously, that's a, a, a big must for them having a quarterback. We've seen it the past couple of years. They've had a couple guys in there trying to fill that void. Now they get their franchise guy, bring in Jonathan Mingo, a big physical receiver. And we talked about – the depth at corner, guess what? Every team you play this year is going to have some big, nice receivers on the outside. If you don't have guys who can cover those guys, as we've seen over the years, that can lead you to having some issues. Obviously, we went and addressed some things up front, getting after the quarterback. That's a big deal. Uh, the Saints go out, and I, I think they try to address some of the, the voice that they left with, you know, Ellis and, you know, Anya Matagon. They go out to get Brian Breesy, a, a guy from, from Clemson who, uh, Arch, I know you've seen a lot. Uh, they go out and get uh, Kendra Miller who – I know you've seen a lot from TCU. Yeah. It's going to be a battering ram. It's going to be tough. And I think that's why the Falcons went up and want to solidify that defense because overall you look around not just the NFC South, but every other team, they're always going to have weapons on the offensive side. Similar to what we're trying to do here is put up tons of points. They're going to continue to do that as well. And obviously the Bucks had eight picks, a bunch of different guys that uh, I think they're going to feel the world for them. Uh, one guy I like from them was, was Yaya Davey from uh, Louisville mm. who's – you know, a, a sack artist himself, nine sacks coming out of Louisville. And I think it's similar to you look around the league. Everybody's looking for guys who can get after the quarterback, guys who can make plays on the offense, which is the name of the game. But I think the NFC South and what those three teams are trying to do are similar to what we've done here. So it's going to be exciting to see how all the pieces come together. But I think you guys are right when you say you just don't know until Sunday rolls around and those guys get a chance to put that on the field and it all comes together to show the complete product. Yeah, I mean, there's there's definitely been some change in, the, in this division over the last few years. You think about two first ballot Hall of Famers and Drew Brees and Tom Brady coming out of this division that are no longer there, right? Yeah. So teams have had to retool their quarterback position. Atlanta Falcons included in that conversation. What do you? How do you feel like the rest of the division stacks up? Well, the 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 narrative that there's a whole bunch of pressure on on Desmond Ritter is one that I find comical in the fact that 
there's always pressure on the quarterback. No doubt. Okay, I don't care. By the way, there's pressure on Derek Carr in New Orleans, yeah. uh, Baker Mayfield in Tampa, yeah. and the new guy, uh, Bryce Young in Carolina. And you could probably go to the other 28 teams in the National Football League and say, there's pressure on the quarterback. So this whole narrative, boy, there's a lot of pressure on uh, you know Desmond Ritter to come in and get it done. Yeah, that's what the position goes with. That, that's part of it. Okay, he understands that. I don't think that there's any more even keel. We've all had a chance to talk to him. Is as even keel a guy as there is. I think all the teams did did stuff to adjust. I think New Orleans did a really good job. You mentioned some of their draft picks. I think A.T. Perry, the kid they drafted oh, yeah. out of Wake Forest in the mm-hmm. sixth round, outstanding wide receiver who lit it up with Sam Hartman up for the for the Demon Deacons. I think he's going to add to what they've got in their wide receiver room. Uh, Kalijah Cansey, can he be Aaron Donald in the interior with Vita Vea right next to him? Can he step in and be that guy that's a problem like Aaron Donald is for the Rams coming out of the same college of Pitt? for Tampa Bay. Uh, and then, of course, can the young quarterback. They need to find a different podium for Bryce to stand behind. Oh, when he my a, goodness. He a press conference. <laughs> oh, my I guess they, had, they still had the Cam Newton pro, <laughs> Cam Newton one. But anyway, I think I, I talked about him. I think he's a savant at quarterback. I yeah. think the guy understands the game mm. to the highest possible level. I think it's really cool how exciting and, and really uncertain things are. Make no mistake, Atlanta's additions, as you mentioned, in free agency – puts them right in the mix to win this thing. Uh-huh. Okay. Yep. And that's what's fun about it. Well, guys, you look around the NFL, to your point, Arch, is that you got divisions like the AFC East, right? Like, you think about around the league, there's certain divisions because they already have that established quarterback. They've got the, the laundry list of talented players behind them that you just expect them to be able to take that division. Like, it's theirs for the taking, and if anybody else wins it, it's a surprise. It's still wide open in the right. NFC South. Mm-hmm. And that's why this offseason became so important because everybody's kind of on the same playing field here. Like, what players are you going to bring in and which of those players are going to step up and really take over and start winning football games? That's no what it's all about. Speaking no of doubt. winning football games, we'll close on this. One of the biggest, next biggest moments of the offseason will be the schedule release. Mm, yeah, baby. We already know the Falcons' opponents for next yeah. year. We just yeah. don't know when we're going to play them. Yeah. It's a time when a lot of teams try to build excitement with their free agency additions, with their draft picks, and this is your chance to see them on X, Y, and Z date against the New York Jets, who are on the on the schedule for the Atlanta Falcons next year. They've got a new quarterback, Ooh. one that we all know in Aaron Rodgers. Yeah. Well. But let's, DJ, I'm going to start with you. All right. What kind of excitement are you seeing in the Falcons' 2023 schedule as it's going to come out here in a couple weeks? You know what's is ironic that we're talking about the schedule. We talked about the different additions around the league. Arch just mentioned the quote-unquote pressure on different quarterbacks. Well, guess what? We get a chance to see all the top young draft picks yep. at quarterback uh-huh. this year. You're talking about Bryce Young. Obviously, we'll see him twice. C.J. Stroud, who played Houston this year. How about Anthony Richardson with the Colts? <laughs> They're talking about playing him from day one. And then possibly, possibly seeing Will Levis in Tennessee, If you know, depending on what happens with Tannehill. But you got a chance to see – the new crop of young QBs. Talk about Aaron Rodgers, a guy who's been around for a while. Obviously, we'll get a chance to see him. We've seen him before. We know what that's <laughs> like. But how about these young guys going against our Falcons? And it's going to be fun to see how they kind of develop as the season go on, but also how much pressure we could put on these young bucks to, to, to maybe give us a few here and there. So I, I'm excited for those matchups yeah. uh, when the season rolls around. DJ, you mentioned the quarterbacks. Yes, C.J. Stroud, Bryce Young, Anthony Richardson. Uh, maybe Jordan Love with yeah. Green Bay, uh, Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields. There was a little bit of, uh, uh, speaking of running back pushback, Jameer Gibbs going to the Detroit, Detroit Lions, Lions yeah. will face uh, will face Detroit next year. And then Kyler Murray, Arizona Cardinals. A lot of really talented quarterbacks on the schedule. What are you well, excited for? Well, we for? might see Kyler Murray. I'm not sure where he's going to be. It depends, on, it depends on if it's early in the year or it depends on if he decides to play or not. But, uh, Will Levis out of Minnesota, as you mentioned, shock Minnesota. So you're going to get all four of the new quarterbacks are all come to Atlanta, as you just talked about. Let's not forget uh, Hinden Hooker, who went to Detroit. Yep. He could potentially be on the field, you know, not wishing anything on Jared Goff, but right. Hinden Hooker with an opportunity there. You're going to get uh, Cartersville own uh, and, and Trevor Lawrence. You're going to see him down in Jacksonville or 
may see him in London. I'm not sure. I'm yeah. hearing some <laughs> vibes about that. And that stay tuned on that one. So you find out where Atlanta's going to actually play Jacksonville this year, but uh, great opportunity to see all the young stars that are coming in the league. Some of the young promise that's coming in the league. And we've got it right here in Atlanta as well. Guys, I know it's hard to answer this question. I'll finish with this, but, and maybe it's just because we're having so much fun on this and there is excitement, but do you guys remember a time when there was like optimism like there is right now. I feel like there's a ton of optimism with this team going into next season. Yes, they had money to spend in free agency. They were able to add some really critical pieces. But so far, again, you, you're hoping everybody stays healthy. You're hoping these guys grow, develop, turn out to be the players that you thought. But this looks like a really good roster going into 2023. And, and I, I, yeah. Before you jump in, Arch, I, I add to that, I think the optimism comes in from, we think about the last two years where everybody's talked about the Falcons have been in salary cap just a <laughs> bliss. <laughs> yeah. But now you're able to add and bring more value to the roster. And nothing against the, the guys who've been in the roster the last two years, but you have absolutely upgraded this roster. So now, and you look at what Arthur Smith and his staff has done the last two years. Last year, they said the Falcons would win how many games? Two games maybe? Three <laughs> games? If that, if, at the most – so. And you end up, you know, absolutely getting seven, eight wins last year. Now you bring that same kind of attitude that Arthur Smith brings the last two years, and you upgrade it with the roster. Oh, man. Oh, it gives you pause to think, hey, this team can absolutely make some noise this year yeah. with what they've done the last two years without being able – to have value at upgrade that roster. Well, people talked about how uh, Arthur and Terry put this game, th this roster, the last two years together by, with bailing wire. Okay, <laughs> bailing string and, and trying to string a bail here or there and trying to keep it from falling out. Uh, they've bolted some things in. Yeah. Things, some things have solidified. Yeah. They've they've locked some things down. Um, optimism. Have to go back and broadcast in the games for the last twenty years. Probably have to go back to the seventeen team. Uh, that was a lot of optimism coming out of the Super, Super Bowl. Bowl. The 17 yeah. team went to the playoffs. It was the only team in the NFC that repeated a playoff trip yeah. from year, the year before. Lost in that second round to Philly. Philly goes on and wins it. Uh, but it's probably you got to go back to maybe 18. So it's been about five years since there's been some optimism around this football team. It can go do some damage. And I can't wait for it to look like this again. Yes. This right here, yes. completely there you packed go. out, rocking. People That's what you want. In the seats, no 100%. Doubt. No oh, doubt. Do you have the same kind of optimism? Let us know. This is a pretty good roster, and things are looking bright for the 2023 Atlanta Falcons. That's going to do it for the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. I'm Derek Rackley. That's DJ Shockley, Dave Archer. So glad to bring you all of the draft recap and everything, and we will bring you some of the next biggest moments for the Atlanta Falcons when they come up. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Take care. What would you say? Let's freaking Let's go. go. <laughs> yeah.